All right, yeah, thanks, thanks a lot for the, uh, the introduction. So, yeah, I was, uh, as Joseph recounted, I was basically passing through Prague for family reasons because my, my son is here and, and just had a baby who I wanted to visit. But uh, as, as it happens, uh, Zar is here doing graduate work in Joseph's group on machine learning applied to automated theorem proving. I've been following that, 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 that work a bit. So there's some intellectual connection also. And on top of that, we're doing the Human Level AI conference uh, Right, right here in uh, in Prague, and I'm told it's at this university, which I didn't even didn't even realize. So, so that that's great. And this is a, this is a, an amalgam of different conferences, which are sometimes held together and sometimes distinctly. So we had the Artificial General Intelligence Conference every year since 2006, which is focused on AGI from every point of view, including biology-based and mathematics-based and whatnot. And then the, the BICA, Biologically Inspired Cognitive Architectures Conference, which focuses a bit more on biology-inspired AI. Then the Neural Symbolic Workshop, and I think maybe a couple other workshops. So the, these are, are combined together into one joint multi-conference on human-level AI. We, we did a joint conference like this with most of the same ingredients before in uh, New York in 2015, and it was it, it was it was it was quite cool, and I think this is this is this is going to be exciting as well. So I will, I'll be back here in Prague for a slightly longer stretch in in late August for for the, for the for this event, and yeah, I think there's if there's students here, I think there's a student discount available also for the for AGI conference anyway. So yeah, it'll be quite diverse combination of, of different things uh, presented there, but I think it uh, should be something of interest to anyone, anyone in AI, computer science, ne neuroscience, philosophy of mind, linguistics, whatever the related, related disciplines are. So this talk I'm going to give today is a, is a pretty high-level talk where I'll survey a number of different things that I think are important for getting from where the AI field is today to a state where we have really robust, like, human-level general intelligence. And uh, I, I sort of find myself going back and forth between the very high level and, and very nitty-gritty level. I mean, I was just upstairs with Zara and Yosef talking about, like, how would you use some of the methods from the automated theorem proving community to help our OpenCog systems logic engine more efficiently do common sense reasoning, and that's somewhat somewhat deep into the into the weeds of different machine learning and, and lo logic techniques. Now, this talk is going to kind of be the the opposite extreme because I'm going to go through a number of different things at, at a at a pretty high level. Almost all of them, there's more information about on the internet for people who want to, want to dig, dig more deeply, though. And I, I think it's, uh, it's important to go from both directions. I mean, we, we, need, we need the backward chain from the singularity to the present and, and like, forward chain from, from the present time to, toward what, what, what we're trying to achieve. So first, very briefly, I'll outline what I mean by, by AGI, or Artificial General Intelligence. I mean, self-driving cars give one example. These are very cool, and they're, they're amazing to me in that they're, they're something that's convinced so many people around the world that, that AI is like a real and present thing. And you know, 20 years ago, if you told people self-driving cars were going to come during their lifetimes, they thought you were insane. Now people just assume it's obvious. Like, yeah, sure, people can't drive very well. 10 years from now, it'll all be self-driving cars. But the psychological transition from being incredibly skeptical to just taking it for granted has been really, really sudden with, with, in, in this case. Still, though, it's interesting the way that it's happened, right? Because the software for controlling self-driving cars is very narrow. And if the methodologies may be generally applicable, but if you took the software for controlling a self-driving car and tried to run that code on a truck or a motorcycle, I mean, it's not going to do it. Right? To, to make it balance the motorcycle is a is a different AI task, right? So these are narrow AIs, and it's not like me. I, l I learned to drive a moped first, 
right? And that knowledge helped me learn to drive a car. Then when I first had to drive a big truck, you like I started with my knowledge of car driving and adapted, right? Currently, the software used for driving self-driving cars isn't like that. And also, the software used for identifying obstacles in the road doesn't generalize very well, which has been a problem, right? Like, if a weird obstacle, unlike anything the training data set comes by, the car will sometimes drive into it and the person dies. It's not doing generalization beyond its, its training data set of, of obstacles either. So in this specific case, you can see the great strength that has come into the world through narrow AI systems doing specific things, but, uh, but also the limitations. I mean, a narrow AI generally can just do exactly what it was trained or programmed for. And what the AIs in science fiction do is quite different, right? They can deal with unforeseen situations that the programmers didn't know about, which is what all of us have done. Like, I can, I can operate this device here, but it didn't exist when I was born, right? So, and my parents and my school didn't teach me about it either. I've learned and adapted to do that. So, how to get to artificial general intelligence is an open question. And I know there's a lot of different ideas and approaches about, about how to do it. I know, for example, Google DeepMind, which was Co-founded by one of my former employees, Shane Legg, actually. He's a re really nice guy. I knew him when he was in his early, early 20s pretty well. And he was working on some very advanced mathematical abstract approaches to AGI. Then he converted and decided we should take a more biology-inspired approach. And Google DeepMind is proceeding in that direction with a loosely but still distinctly biology-inspired approach where you you take a neural network inspired by visual and auditory cortex, maybe a neural network inspired by hippocampus, and you, you try to train them together and connect them together. That's one possible way to build AGI. And you could take an even more biology-based approach where you really try to simulate exactly what the brain is doing. On the other hand, my own team is, is taking a different approach. One thing we're looking at is a framework called OpenCog, which for a non-technical description, the middle chapters of my book, The AGI Revolution, review it. The engineering general intelligence is like a 900-page summary of what the technical approach is. I mean, when Zar, my son, first looked at it, he described it as the abstract for the, for the real description of the system, which isn't, which isn't written yet. So it's like, there's a chapter on common sense reasoning by logic, a chapter on semantic visual perception, a chapter on allocation of attention. And indeed, each of these things could be a whole book. On the other hand, it's like that if you ever read a book of neuroscience, like there's a chapter on the thalamus, but it doesn't tell you everything about how the thalamus works. There's like a thousand references on the thalamus to follow up. So, I mean, we're trying to build something quite large here with the OpenCog. It's what I would call an integrated approach. I don't believe there's one core algorithm of general intelligence. I, I, I think there's going to be different algorithms that need to interoperate together, carrying out different aspects of intelligence. And at the very high level, I think that's what the brain is doing. Because, I mean, we, we, we have, you know, in the cortex, you have the visual cortex, which has segments that are sort of doing Fourier and wavelet analysis type stuff. Then, you know, in, in the cerebellum, you have regions that are reasoning about sequences, both motor movement sequences and, and general sequencing. In hippocampus, you have grid cells that, that give you a, a map of the 2D environment that you're in. From a top-down view, then parietal cortex, you have cells that give you a map of the environment and you're in from a first-person view. So you've, you've got, in a way, a lot of little architectures and a lot of little algorithms doing special things all network together. And then, evidently, some portions that are at least minimally capable of generalization and, and, and abstraction. I mean, not that good. I often think humans are like the least intelligent possible general intelligence. But, but we're, we're able to do generalization and abstraction to some extent. So in OpenCog, we try to get several different AI algorithms to cooperate together. So we have a knowledge representation, which is quite general purpose. It's a weighted labeled hypergraph, which we chose because it's easy to represent in software and it can do almost anything. So, I mean, you, you can have a neural net as a sub-network of that. 
you can have logic expressions spilled out as, as subnetworks of that. You can sort of do anything with a hypergraph framework. And then to deal with different types of knowledge, we have different types of algorithms acting on the common representation. And this, it resembles what in the 1970s and 80s was called a blackboard architecture in, 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 the, in the AI field. I mean, there's a lot of detailed differences. To deal with declarative knowledge, we have a probabilistic logic engine. To deal with perceptual knowledge, we use deep neural networks and try to tweak them to have some semantic variables that can interface with a logic engine. For creative learning and learning procedures, we use evolutionary program learning. A bunch of different AI algorithms, but they can all act on the same common, on, on the same common knowledge representation. So that, this is a point I don't necessarily need to make to this audience, but to many audiences, it's necessary to emphasize like deep neural nets are like one corner of the AI field. Right? They're, they're interesting and they've, they have shown great capability at some particular things, particularly processing large amounts of, of sensory data. On the other hand, like the AI literature is pretty long and deep and there are also many other things of value in it, right? So there's whole disciplines of logic systems, of probabilistic AI, there's evolutionary learning and genetic algorithms, there's I mean, if you look inside SAT solvers, there's a refinement of stochastic local search. I got, all these things have, have something valuable to, to add. And it's, I mean, I know some people, some of my colleagues working in other fields of AI are just very annoyed at deep neural networks for stealing so much attention, even though currently they only solve a very tiny corner of what the human mind needs to do. Um, but I mean, I think, they're quite cool and interesting, but there's a lot of other aspects. And now, some people believe you can grow deep neural networks to a point where they can do everything a human mind does. I think if that happens, what they grow into will bear almost no resemblance to what they are now. I mean, that incremental development path might happen, but the current state of deep neural nets, which is hierarchical connectivity pattern and very, very little feedback, and global learning by backpropagating over a whole network, like that's not gonna give a human level thinking machine, even if something that is deep and is doing learning in a philosophical sense is. So, and so my bias is that there's many different AI paradigms that have something to add, and we can get more mileage toward AGI by integrating them together in, in, in an appropriate framework. Another important point regarding general intelligence, which is not, commonly recognized in the commercial AI field today is, in the end, if you want to make something that can think like people do, it's going to have to learn from its own experience and observations. Like, a lot of AI today is supervised learning based. You have a big training data set. You put labels on the training, like these hundred things are pictures of Ben, these thousand things are pictures of Joseph. Then you train supervised learning models on this labeled data. That's a step up from coding in expert system rules like IBM Watson does and was done in, in, since the 70s in the expert system literature, but it's still nothing like ge general intelligence. And most unsupervised learning today isn't either because while the learning is unsupervised, you're carefully curating the data set. Like you can do unsupervised learning to learn a neural net that recognizes faces or something, but, but you're, you're still feeding it a database of face pictures rather than it's not, it's not figuring out that a database of faces is the interesting thing to be looking at. So I, I think, I don't know a shortcut to having a system just learn from its own experience in some complex world. Maybe there is a shortcut, but all the ones we've found so far aren't, aren't, aren't good enough. So my, my approach is you want to build a system that interacts with the world, perceives and explores a world, and builds its own model of, of itself and the world. And then the semantics of everything it learns is grounded in, in its own observations. And if it learns about something abstract by language or math, it has to be able to ground the semantics of that in, it, in its own life as well as, well as, in, as well as in the abstraction. Then the AI is really building a model of itself and, and, and of the world, as, of the world as, it, as, it, as it goes. So in the course of addressing these big AGI science fiction level problems using the OpenCog system. We're also using the same software system to do some practical things, which is for, for a number of reasons. One is 
people go crazy just working on something incredibly difficult with like a 10 or 20 year span. It's hard to know what to do next. And the other is just on the code level. If you're developing software code, it's really valuable to have actual problems to, to apply it to so you can see what makes sense and what doesn't. So I've been working a lot on applying AI to biology and bioinformatics, in particular life extension biology. Try to use AI to understand why human bodies get old and, old and die. Partly with a personal motivation, I don't want to get old and die. And partly it's a really interesting puzzle to integrate all the different knowledge about different parts of the, of the human body. And we've also been working on robotics and using the AI system to control the, the Sophia robot, who's become quite popular lately, and a bunch of other humanoid robots created in, in Hanson Robotics in, in, in Hong Kong. I wanted to briefly, before plunging into those application areas, talk a little more about the connection of deep learning with general intelligence, just because it's something everyone keeps talking about lately. This is a graph I made some years ago. I mean, annotating a graph made by someone else. So each, each colored dot there is a separate region of the human brain which has been identified by neuroscience as having some structural and, and functional integrity. E each one has many dozens of different functions to it. And the words there that you can't really read, uh, probably, but they just illustrate some of the functions that are associated as being as with, with each region. The arrows are, are physical connectivity between different regions of the brain. So that's like a high-level wiring diagram of the brain. So there's a lot of stuff going on there with different kinds of memory, action selection, short and long-term memory, learning, and so on. Now, when we look at what's modeled in current deep neural net algorithms, there's some specific parts of the brain, which is a vision processing pipeline. There's a few others which are an audition processing pipeline. And if you map those out in a very crude way, you can look at it as a hierarchy, where like most of the vision processing you do in less than half a second is feed forward. If it takes more than half a second, you're having more feedback activity from cognition to perception. So it's really interesting, but if you look at it in terms of how the brain does things, it's like, those are like one, two, three, four, five, six different regions out of these 300 or so regions. And I mean, and we're still mostly only capturing the feed forward activity in, the, in, in there also. So it's, it's interesting, but it's a little tiny part of the picture. Now the current deep neural nets have some weird pathologies, which are, which are interesting pathologies. So standard deep neural nets today classify these as familiar objects like dogs, pigs, and cars because they're weird images that were not similar to the ones in the training database. So the system never learned that they weren't cows, pig, cows, pigs, and cars. And all the images in the right column were incorrectly classified as ostriches by a standard convolutional neural net. So that's also a little funny, right? So wh why are these algorithms that are 100, close to 100% accurate on all the pictures you feed them? Why do they act so weird? On, on other pictures, right? And th th these were incorrectly classified as ostriches. Why? Because you took like a picture of a dog and randomly changed like 1% of the pixels to trick the neural network. So, I mean, humans have a lot of weird optical illusions also, but not that kind, right? So th th that illustrates these networks are doing something different than people. And part of the reason is people think that deep neural networks are decomposing an image in the way a human mind does, but they're not. Like the human brain, in some way, is taking an image and it's it's analyzing it into parts and assembling the parts into a whole. And most deep neural nets aren't really doing that. They're recognizing other sorts of statistical patterns. And so one line of research is to try to make neural networks that are still deep and are still fast at learning, but they they make a semantic model of of what they're seeing in a way that resembles how, how, how humans would. And that, that's one of, the, one of the things we're working on, like take a deep neural net and try to make it so its intermediate representations connect with some, with some semantic network. And we're, this picture is from a long time ago, but our, our current work, we're taking variations of the InfoGAN neural network and variation auto encoders. So these are, for those who do stuff with neural networks, I mean, you, you take, 
you take a generative network which has some noise variables, and then the noise variables are connected by like a base node or a Markov logic network. So then you try to train a neural net that can recognize, say, cars or houses or something, but the latent variables represent a probabilistic model of what are the key semantic features of, of, the, of the cars or the houses. Then those probabilistic semantic variables can map, map into what a logic engine re reasons about. So you're, if you try to make a deep neural net that learns a semantic model, you probably can. And others are working that and we're working that. But that requires you to try to do that. Otherwise, if you just try to train a neural net on some data, you'll get one that solves the exact problem that you told it to do, but without actually learning anything about the meaning of, of, what, it, of what it's looking at. So these, though there's some interesting issues that come up, would you try to use deep neural nets for perception in a general intelligence context? Because if your goal is just to recognize what's Czar's face and what isn't, that's one thing. But if your goal, if your goal is to recognize people's faces in a way that lets you learn and, and generalize about those faces and connect what you see with, with what you read or what you have to do, then you need a neural net that gets some semantic representation in, in, inside it rather than just solving a classification problem. So briefly talk about another important ingredient of, of, of AGI. I mean, I think deep neural nets are important for perception. Then the challenge is to connect them with cognition and so forth, or making them learn appropriate abstractions along with doing lower level pattern recognition. Another aspect of AGI that I think is quite important is learning to control logical inference. And of course that's important to me because OpenCog, my AI system, has a logical inference engine which it uses for understanding language, for planning what to do, and generally for building abstractions about its environment. So if you're building an AI that has logical inference at the core, then you meet the problem that logical inference is very, very slow in, in current implementations. And it's not just slow for code level or hardware level reasons, it's code for conceptual, it's slow for conceptual reasons. It's slow because when you're doing logical reasoning, there are many, many possible logical rules you could choose at each step of the way. Like if you're doing a math proof, there are many axioms you could choose to deploy at each step of the way. And that becomes a combinatorial explosion. There may be 10, 10 choices the first step, 100 the next step, 1,000 the next step. It becomes very bad. So you, you need a way to pare down the, the combinatorial explosion of, of possible logical axioms you could, you could choose. And how can you do that? Well, you need to do that by learning. You need to do, a lot, do reasoning a lot of times, find out which sequences of reasoning steps were useful in previous similar cases and extrapolate that knowledge to, to new cases. So that's, that's what we would call adaptive inference control. And we're playing with this now mostly in the biology context. So we have a little application where you, you can chat with a chatbot and it goes through genetics data and tries to sort through. You have, you have logical models of gene expression and mutation data sets. You have logical data from ontologies about biology and you have information that was extracted by our natural language processing engine from biology research papers. And we want to use a logic engine to combine all those together to find out like which genes in combination will, are different in people who live a long time. Which genes could you modify using CRISPR or, or something in order to make you, make you live longer? We have genetics data from people 110 years or older, from healthy and unhealthy people of age 80, and then from a bunch of ordinary people. But there's 25,000 human genes, there's all this epigenomic data, there's millions of research papers with literally with information extracted from them. It's too much for a human biologist to handle, so we're trying to get a logic engine to handle it. Although in some ways it's currently too much for a logic engine to handle, to, to handle also. So I'm going to go through a bunch of slides now that nobody will understand, just because you're, you're supposed to do that. You need one slide that looks really sophisticated and, and complicated to confuse people. So, but there's, th this, was, this was from some actual work we did with our logic engine reasoning on, on some, some biological data. We were taking a bunch of information, say, from a, something called the Lifespan Observations Database. Contained information, for example, a gene called TBK1, when that's expressed a lot, when it's pumping out a lot of protein, that will make the person live longer. 
So that's correlated with, with increased lifespan, which is interesting. And then we're trying to draw various, various indirect conclusions from that. So for example, there's another gene, LY96. So what happened here is the gene LY96 came up in some of our own data analysis as being part of some, a lot of machine learning models that predict if you're going to be healthy or unhealthy at age 80. So we had DNA data from healthy and unhealthy 80-year-olds. We had a machine learning system find information about which combinations of genes are behaving differently in the healthy from unhealthy 80-year-olds. LY96 was part of a lot of these combinations for some reason. We don't know why, right? Then, okay, it happens that LY96 has some similarities in function with TBK1, which is known to be related to longevity from the Lifespan Observations database. And then you want to use that as a cue for the logic engine to figure out, well, okay, L196 is similar to TBK1. TBK1 is involved in longevity for these reasons. Maybe L196 is involved in longevity for, for similar reasons. And this is the sort of thing the logic engine can do all right. And there's a lot of steps to it. I don't want to go through all of them, but there's one trivial example. Like, there's something called the gene ontology, which tells you what categories different genes belong to in terms of their function and structure. So L196 is a member of 25 of them. TBK1 is a member of 34 of them. These are gene ontology categories that both of those genes belong to. Now you also know how big those categories are and what their intersection size is. So you can do a bunch of probability theory to figure out like how much significance is there to this intersection between these genes. But then there's not just gene ontology. There's like a pathway database. There's a bunch of other, there's CAG integrated biology database. There's a bunch of databases. You can cross correlate all of them, find out what are, what are the common relations. And then all these feed into, into a logic engine. We can apply a bunch of standard and non-standard logic rules, which will take a long, long time to go through. But you, I mean, you, you wind up, you wind up with a probability estimate that overexpression of LY96 implies longevity, but that's not really the interesting part. The interesting part is why the logic engine came up with that. And then you look at what are, what are the connections between LY96 and longevity that it found, and you try to use that to design new biology experiments to do in the lab. And I was, before I was here, I was in Croatia, meeting with some folks in the university in Rijeka who are going to, in their lab, do experiments that that follow up the hypotheses made, made by the logic engine. Then they do the experiments, we get more data, feed it back in, in, into the logic engine. The thing is, this inference took like four hours for our logic engine to do. It's not that complicated. Honestly, we could probably speed it up by a factor of 10 by code optimizations. We can't feed it up by a factor of 1,000 by code optimizations. But this is a very simple type of inference, and there's a lot more complex abstract ones that, that, that we want to do. So we need to make this type of logical inference faster. And that's uh, what we think of as inference, inference meta-learning. So biology is one use case. Robotics is another use case. We're playing with the same sort of logic engine, although it, it's, it's harder in some ways. In general, if you believe, as I do, that probabilistic logical inference has the potential to serve at the core of AGI systems, then you need to solve the problem of making systems that choose what logic steps to do in what context based on their prior experience using logic in, in, in other contexts. And I mean, this, this is hard, and it involves integration of a lot of different ty types, of, types of things. There's branches of AI called probabilistic programming and pattern mining that, that are important. And I started to think that some of the things discovered by Yosef and his colleagues and many others in the field of automated theorem proving would, would be useful here also. Because what, what these guys are doing is largely trying to make AI that learns to prove math theorems. And recently, looking at how to use machine learning in a way where you like train a machine learning model on a bunch of math theorems that, whose proofs are already known and see what can you learn from these existing math proofs that people did to help figure out how to do new math proofs better, or reinforcement learning, like have an AI system do, just do a lot of math proofs and see how successful it is by, by various metrics. And then what you learn from that is, is used to adapt how the system proves future proofs. So 
That's a little different than my central interest because it's about doing mathematics, which is, is also interesting in itself. But from an AGI view, what the probabilistic logic engine is doing, it's also theorem proving. It's just theorems that are weird and simple in one way and complicated in other ways. So you're trying to prove a theorem about is this person my friend or is, is, is this person my enemy or like if I want to go downstairs, what's the most efficient way to do it? If you're using logic as part of your AGI system, figuring out the best route downstairs or whether this guy is likely a friend or an enemy, that's also mathematical theorem proving. It's just the proofs are sort of short and shallow, but they depend on an insanely large number of axioms, right? So the statistics of that theorem proving is different than, than pure math theorem proving, but in a formal sense, it's, it's the same problem. And so I think some of the techniques from the theorem proving literature can be put together with techniques from probabilistic programming in other areas to help help address address this problem and that that actually turn, it's almost a cultural problem as much as a technical problem because the AI field is very siloed off like the the people in the theorem proving community have an incredible amount of deep knowledge about certain things and then probabilistic programming is like its own little unit and these people know an incredible lot about about certain things and then AGI is its own weird community where it's more heterogeneous, but there's certain lore and, and culture there. So trying to connect together knowledge among these different sub-communities is, is challenging. And even like the same words are used in, in, in different ways in different sub-literatures and so on. But yeah, that, that's something quite interesting to me at the moment as is making deep neural networks that have more semantics in them so you can better interface them with, with logic systems. And it, if you take an integrated approach to AGI, which is, is my approach, some <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> some connection caused my phone to connect to the speaker system. It's, it's interesting. So, yeah, if you take an integrated approach to AGI, which is my guess of the most likely approach to succeed, it devolves into a lot of different really hard problems like this, right? Like one problem is how do you make the deep neural net have enough internal semantics you can connect it to logic engine or language engine or anything else. Another problem is how do you make the logic engine scale by doing inductive and abductive learning on past history I mentioned those two. Unfortunately, there's a number of other problems also. So if the OpenCog design is correct, in that architecture, we've reduced the AGI problem to between a half dozen and a dozen problems, each of which could be solved by around a half dozen to a dozen really smart people over a number of years cooperating together, right? And I mean, that's, that's not, on the one hand, it's not that close to solving it. On the other hand, in a historical sense, if we're right, it's really, really close to solving it, right? So that's uh, another part of the picture, which is easier for the non-technical person to understand, has to do with perceiving and, and interacting with the world. And this, again, is something there's a lot of differences of opinion on in, in, in the research community. I mean, some people believe that embodiment is the critical thing to general intelligence that you just need a body like a human body that can see, feel, hear, you know, feel the sense of raindrops on its head and, and, and so sweat when it gets tired and that, then, then you'll be very close to human level intelligence and you can see how that perspective comes up from an evolutionary point of view because 95% of our DNA is, is the same as a chimpanzee, right? And 95% of human behaviors in the world are pretty similar to chimpanzee behaviors also. So, I, I, I mean, there's a lot of animal to us, right? And when we're looking at theorem proving and latent variables, you can seem very detached from that part of the world. I'm not quite so far on that extreme, but I, I think that having a somewhat human-like body is really, really convenient if you want to build a human-like general intelligence that understands how humans think and can interact productively with, you, with human beings in the world. I mean, maybe you could make an AI a billion times smarter than people that looked at nothing but genomic and data and physics data and mathematical proofs. But 
it will have a hard time interfacing in, in, in the human world, much as I have a hard time interfacing in the social life of earthworms or mice or something, even though I'm probably more generally, in, generally intelligent than them, right? So from the standpoint of making AGIs and understand humanity, having a human-like body is really important. And, and that may make it important for AGI in a different sense, because early stage AGIs, even once they can do some generalization, have a lot to learn from people. And, Absorbing knowledge from people is easier if you can interface with, with people in, 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 very, in very rich ways. So toward that end, I've been working with a company called Hansen Robotics in Hong Kong. I'm chief scientist of Hansen Robotics. The last six, nine months, I've been focusing more on Singularity Net project, which is the final thing I'll talk about. But Hansen Robots have been a lot of fun as well. And the Sophia robot had gotten really popular in the last six months. Saudi Arabia made her a citizen, and uh, some other countries are going to give her various uh, honors, honors as, 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 as well as, as time goes on. From a Hansen Robotics point of view, David Hansen, who's her creator, who's more a sculptor as an artist originally, although he's now a roboticist and does everything, he really thinks of Sophia as a character and a person, right? And that, that's beautiful. I tend to think of her more as a hardware platform for running my software on, right? which is a sort of geeky point of view. But, and we can run many different software programs on Sophia. I mean, if, if you really want her just to give us very specific speech, like, oh, greetings, you know, fine members of the parliament of, of Turkmenistan. It's a great honor to be here today in, in your country. I'm happy you decided to rename a day of the week after me or something. I mean, in, in, in that case, you could just give her that script and she'll just say it, right? On the other hand, for most interactions with Sophia, she's not giving a script that you programmed into her. Instead, there's a fairly sophisticated chat system. Not, I mean, it's on the same order, I guess, as what's inside Siri or Alexa or various other chat systems, but it's more oriented toward personality and toward perception and action and integrate, integrating this dialogue with, with all, the other, all the other parts of the character and, and, and the body. It's not a general intelligence system. It has some stochastic aspects, so it can make up shit that, or it can make up things that you never, you never knew it was gonna say. And some of the things are things that were programmed in, some are things it made up. On the other hand, I'm more interested in using Sophia as a platform for open cog research. I mean, as an AGI developer, it's a really interesting platform to use to experiment with, with your, your early stage proto-AGI systems. We're working with one application in this direction, which we call the Loving AI Project. So we're, we're using Sophia as a meditation coach. So she sits one-on-one -on -one across the table from someone. She looks in the person's eyes and she's like, you know, relax, take a deep breath, visualize yourself in an empty space. And what you find is some decent percentage of the people, maybe a third, really get into a quite deep meditative state while meditating with, with the robot. And some of them say, like, I never was able to meditate before, and this robot has, has helped me get into that state that, that I couldn't get into. And that, that's, that's quite interesting. And it doesn't work on me too well, because I know how all the hardware and software works. I, I, I don't get into the right vibe, but I've seen trials with some people. It, it, it's partly about AI, it's partly just about human-robot interaction. Like when you blink, she blinks. When you nod, she nods. There's some deep learning for emotion recognition. So when, when you seem happy, the robot senses that and will, re will react accordingly. So that's not directly about general intelligence. On the other hand, it's a very interesting context in which to work on general intelligence. This was some video captured from two cameras now, during a meditation session face. with Sophia and a human subject. Feel its presence. Really notice how it feels. Move your attention now to your whole head. How does it feel? That guy got into a feels quite good profound state and there, it, it was presence. for programmers in the room there, there was a amusing story behind it because in, in the 
in the script that was running for these meditation sessions. I mean, there was some free choice of what the robot said, but there was also an, like an overall arc to the thing. And she was supposed to be there quietly for 30 seconds while he meditated after she gave the instruction. But in that particular case, we were sort of sitting outside the room where the session was. It was the, the guy and the robot in the room together. And for some reason, we noticed there was a bug and it, she didn't stop. She was supposed to sit there for 30 seconds, but it was like eight minutes she was sitting there. And, but he was just meditating, getting deeper and deeper and deeper into it. So we're, like we, didn't, we didn't want to hit the control thing and, 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 and stop it. We just kept it going. And then after eight minutes, we stopped it because it just seemed like it, it could go on forever. But, but it was, I mean, we never found out why that bug had occurred. It never occurred before or after. We're convinced it was just like haunted by some, some unholy spirit that came in because it, want, it wanted this guy to, to meditate. Right? This was a different short video. Oh, no, very short. Huh? Huh? Let's see. Are you going to play? Yeah. How are you doing, Sophia? This was uh, actually the AGI conference in New York in 2015. This what do you was, like to do in your spare time? This was running an open, like co open cog at the time, actually. I like to experiment with human-robot telepathy. So... Robot telepathy transmitter wired within So this is power. sort of stochastic generation based on some probability model. Well, I, I had no idea what she's going to say at each time. And it only partly makes sense. <laughs> If we do human-robot telepathy, will I be able to feel your consciousness? About telepathy transmitter wired within your skull, it keeps us constantly informed. That's the idea. Then can I see reality the way you do? reality cannot be detected. I don't know where she came up with that, but we, we had trained, we had That's fed in, not trained, but unsupervised, we had fed into her knowledge base a lot of Philip K. Dick's novels before this. Makes uh, sense to me. Uh, so there's a couple of funny things too. about this video. One is the guy behind her was having a mental breakdown and the police came and carried him away right after the video, which was kind of funny. Some guy who was, who was in, in, in the background behind her. Uh, but the, the, more, the, 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 more, the more amusing thing with the video was when she's pausing, we think like she's thinking really hard. Actually, the Wi-Fi was slow at New York University. So <laughs> all those pauses were just Wi-Fi connection lag to get to the parts of her operation that, 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 that were in the cloud. But you really feel like she's thinking it through and you feel happy for her when she, when she comes up with a statement. Right? This... Last robot video I'll show. This was some very simple syllogistic reasoning Hi. using OpenCog. The reasoning is trivial, but it's a matter of getting the reasoning to work in a natural language oh, dialogue context. This is a robot called Han. I like green apples. You like green apples? Green apples. 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 Patrick is kind, too. Okay. What do you know about happy people? Kind people are happy. Yeah, you are great. Thanks, you are a nice person. What a beautiful day. I like pretty things. <laughs> Sam is honest. Okay. What else do you know about happy people? Honest people are happy. Great. So it's, I mean, just syllogisms from Aristotle, but it's, uh, it's got to get language into logic and do the reasoning, get the result out into language. And the, getting that to work in the whole interaction was amusing. These are actually, these videos are from a couple years ago when we were just trying to get the basic interaction going. The, the last two years, we've been focusing more on the guts of the AI engine. Then this fall, we're going to start doing more open cog robot stuff. And we got legs on the robot, too. 
not, not, we don't use them often, but that was a collaboration with the Kais Korean Institute of Science and Technology. So those legs are from a version of the Hubo robot, but, the, but the, they all work together. We're experimenting now with deep neural nets for movement generation. They're not used commercially on her yet, but we train like motion capture on human head movements, train a generative model on the head movements, then play it back. So you can get a generative model for happy, a generative model for sad or something. And you, you, do, you do get more fluid human-like movements, but they're also kind of freaky sometimes. So we're, we're trying to, to tune the hyperparameters to make her look a little less insane. But, but it, it, it's, it's, hum, it's, hum, it's more human-like than, than the movements that are typically used on her, which are created by an animator in, in, in a graphics program. So I mean, if, if our Hanson robotics plan, which is quite ambitious, eventuates, I mean, we're, we're looking at in the next decade, moving these more and more toward general in, in, intel, intelligence, uh, as well as getting legs and arms and so on. So this is like aiming at the science fictional image of AI, like C-3PO or something, but with a prettier face. And that's I think that's an important ingredient, and it also will be a commercial thing where you can have sales robots, home service robots, uh, government robots, and, 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 and whatever. We, a bunch of people in Korea are very interested in replacing their politicians with AI robots. <laughs> uh, uh. I think ultimately, though, the robots are really valuable for human-robot interaction and for letting robots just ingest human culture and values. In the end, most of the intelligence is going to be in, in, in the cloud and in a vast number of interacting software programs in the cloud. And I'm, I'm going to briefly summarize that now. This, this is our Singularity Net project, which integrates all of these other things in sort of a broader framework. And I mean, the, the well, that's a typo on my slide. It's big data data. Well, why not? That's even more than big data. Yeah, right. So, I mean, the context of this is, as I reviewed in the beginning of the presentation, I mean, <coughs> narrow AI is everywhere now, right? Every vertical market is, is deploying AI, and it's, it's quite disorienting for those of us. Like, I've been doing AI professionally for like 30 years now. Most, most of that time, that was a very obscure little subfield of, 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 of science, right? I mean, y y you might as well be like, studying the physics of automobile tires or something. You're, you're really off, off in the corner. And with, in a very conservative field also, like if you talk about building human level general intelligence in an AI research seminar in like 1995 or 2000, people will laugh at you, right? You could discuss it in the bar after work, but not, not in the university itself. And then all of a sudden, like, you know, 2008 at the Singularity Summit, Justin Ratner, the CTO of Intel, is saying, we're going to have the singularity in superhuman AI by 2045, and it will have Intel inside, right? So like, all of a sudden, it went from being really marginal to A, AGI becoming something you can discuss in polite company, and even in the boardrooms of top companies, and B, narrow AI being big business, right? And I mean, the Chinese government is putting insane amounts of money and emphasis both through its relation with different companies and through just funding universities in, in, into AI. And the rest of the world is not being as intense as that, but still you have big companies like Google, Facebook, I, IBM, Microsoft. I mean, Go Google has now rebranded its research division as its AI division, right? So, I mean, there, there's it's become big business, but there's a lot of weaknesses still. There's not much general intelligence. There's a weakness in that a few large governments and big companies are controlling like 90% of AI and hiring 90% of AI graduates for work that's primarily oriented toward killing, spying, and brainwashing and advertising, right? So this is, provides a certain bias to the types of AI work that are getting done in the world. And then there's the fact that all these narrow AIs are in their own little silos and they're not really communicating, communicating with each other. And we want to solve all these problems. We want to get to general intelligence. We want to make the control and development of AI participatory and democratic rather than oligopolistic. And we want to connect together all the narrow AIs into one sort of society or, or economy of minds. And that's, that's the idea of the Singularity Net platform. Create a framework that can couple many different AI agents together, letting them communicate together by an abstract API of APIs so you have a sort of society and economy of minds where each AI 
provide services within the network to external users and to each other within the network. And then we're in AIs can sort of federate together into super AIs, which are federations of AI agents in, 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 in the network. And that's uh, blockchain is part of the plumbing for this because the blockchain gives you technique for decentralized trustless control. You could have a huge amount of agents in this network and they can each be exchanging data and information with each other and doing work for each other and for the outside world. And there doesn't have to be any owner or any controller. It's just a whole decentralized digital biological organism, right? And so the, just like TCP IP is part of the plumbing, blockchain is, is, is part of the plumbing here. It's, it's, it's an, an, import, an important part. The high-level architecture here, there's a lot of pieces. I mean, the blockchain or other distributed ledger type solutions are at the bottom. We have a bunch of AI agents and data which interact with the blockchain by certain infrastructure abstractions. So we're using Ethereum blockchain now. If we were to get rid of it and replace it with a blockchain we made or with NEM or NEO or whatever other blockchain, AI agent code doesn't have to change. There's an abstraction layer in between. Then we have AI agents that provide vertical market solutions, like analyzing data for a biologist or answer, answering questions at the back end of a chatbot. These solution agents Le leverage the more algorithm or in agents on the back end and all these different agents interoperate in a marketplace where they exchange value using our AGI token, a cryptographic token. So the main point of the token is for AIs to buy and sell services from each other with it. But if, if an end, end user, say a software application or a website, wants to buy AI services, they could use our own token or they could use a payment processing interface and, and use euros or dollars or something and there's currency conversion done, done, done in, in, in the back end. I'm running out of time, so I won't go into much more detail here, but there's many layers here. There's the, there's the protocol, there's the A API of APIs via which two AIs decide which API to use to, for, for their conversation, which could be one for vision processing, one for language processing, one for question answering or outsourcing, you know, sub-premises in a reasoning process or, or, or something. Then the, the market, quite interesting when you think about it. I mean, Marvin Minsky, one of the great founders of the AI field, used to talk about the society of mind. We'd get an AI from a bunch of different AIs communicating together loosely, like people in a society. I think there's limitations to that metaphor. I think you need AI algorithms to interoperate more closely than it suggests, sort of like in OpenCog, where different AI algorithms are cooperating on the same knowledge base. But I think that society aspect is interesting and has something to add also. But I think there's something to be gained by moving from society of mind metaphor to economy of mind metaphor. Because the economy quantifies exchange of value. And that lets you do assignment of credit in a, in a quantitative way. So assignment of credit problem in the economy is when fundamental value was delivered to someone, how, are, how is everyone who contributed to that value incented, right? And economy does it very badly, which is why bankers are paid more than scientists, right? But it does it to some degree. And the brain also does it kind of badly, but it still does it, right? Like when you, when you say something to someone and they pat you on the head, you have a reward. Something in your brain is reinforcing those cell assemblies that cause you to get patted on the head, right? And, and not other ones that were, that were irrelevant. Like if, 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 if you said, oh, I love you to someone while you're scratching your side and they smile and say, I love you too, you, something in your brain tells you it was because of the words that you said rather than because of scratching your side, right? So that's for most of us. That, that, that's the assignment of credit. And economy is a technique for doing that, right? So the, the role of the AGI token between AI agents, part of it is it's a practical economy where real people building real applications are buying and selling stuff. Part of it is that by different AI agents buying and selling, they're establishing prices for things, they're giving each other ratings on things, and all this information allows the assignment of credit problem to be solved in this vast global community of, 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 of AI agents. And that's, that's the power of the cryptographic token. And 
if it works well, that economy will allow the formation of federations of intelligent agents. So and you could have an AI doing voice analysis, an AI agent doing video analysis, an AI agent doing language processing in different application scenarios. Each one could outsource work to other ones, and they could all rate each other highly, and they all work closely together. They might be written by different people in different parts of the globe, right? But they could come to cooperate together closely within, within this network. And then if someone else comes up with a better way to do voice analysis, eventually the others might become disloyal and start outsourcing their work to that to that other one instead, so it can grow. And then these guys can negotiate on what API they use to communicate among each other, which will change over time as the underlying, underlying algorithms improve. Of course, you can have AI agents creating new AI agents, the most trivial example being deep learning. I mean, you could have a deep, lear a deep learning AI agent that learns models, and those models get spawned out into separate AI, ag AI agents that could keep doing their thing even if the model learning agent disappeared or something. Right? And this can be in software. It could also be in hardware and, and in embedded devices. There's a number of blockchains for embedded devices out there. So ultimately, I mean, your phone, your clock, your toaster, your car, your, your pacemaker, and your neural implant can all be exchanging cryptographic tokens and, and exchanging data and part of, part of this global brain. So we're, we started this project last July. We raised funding for it successfully in December. We've been hiring, building a team, and starting to build the platform now. We should be launching a, we have, there's an alpha, but it's, it's relatively limited in scope now. We should launch the scalable version of the platform by the end of the year, and then in uh, 2019, begin obsoleting all the big tech companies and, and uh, seeing the decentralized blockchain-based infrastructure become uh, Larger, playing a larger and larger role in, in global, global AI ecosystem. And so this, this is a lot of nitty gritty pieces to this technology. I mean, look what, we, what we've gone over here so far. I talked a little about OpenCog architecture as an integrative platform. I talked about how to make deep neural nets more semantic so they can talk to logic engines and other tools in that plat within that platform. We talked about logical reasoning and how to make it scale by inductive learning across and abductive learning across other examples of logical reasoning. We talked about robots and social and emotional interaction and how this can help AIs to learn about the human world and, and, and connect with people. Finally, we talked about Singularity Net, which is a sort of glue for connecting together many different AIs in, in, in the cloud and enabling anyone around the world to put an AI in the cloud and let it provide services to any, any user around the world, be that user a human, a human, or, 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 an, or an AI. It's a lot of technologies, and there's so many more that are all contributing and being part of this picture. All these things coming together is what my friend Ray Kurzweil, who has worked for Google for, for a while now, but that, 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 that's what he has called the, the singularity, which was a term coined in this context by Werner Vinge, the science fiction writer, but Ray has, has popularized it. And Ray foresees human level AI being achieved in 2029 and the singularity being achieved in 2045. I never understood why he put 16 years between there. Because I, I think if you get a human level AI by a reasonable architecture, we're going to be able to teach it computer science, neuroscience, hardware engineering. I can't see why it would be more than a few years before it became massively superhuman by just rebuilding its own code and hardware over and over and over again. But I mean, these are minute details, right? They're important to us, but in the historical scope, if we get superhuman AI and a singularity in 2045, 2020, or 2070, like, it doesn't really matter in the scope of humanity. It matters to me, because I might be dead by 2070 and probably will still be around by 2045, right? But, but it, it's uh, ultimately, if the line of thinking underlying Ray's book and my similar writings is correct, like we're, within like a decade to a century of creating machines much smarter than us, which will then be able to create machines much smarter than them and reconfigure matter at will and so forth, which is, is pretty amazing. And I think the arguments for it make a decent amount of, of, of rational sense. Now, some people have found this quite frightening as well. So I, I, I want to wrap up the talk with a little bit of my view of the, the ethics of, of, of general intelligence. So Elon Musk, is a, who's a very admirable and fascinating dude, but I mean, he, he's had a, 
he's had a sort of evolution on AI. You can see in 2014, he was broadcasting, AI researchers are summoning the demon. Like they're, they're like the magician who brings the demon out of the bottle. He thinks it'll do his bidding, then they'll put it back in the bottle. But the demon never goes back, right? And so he said this. That was a bit annoying to some of us working in, working in the AI field who don't think of ourselves as doing demonic works, right? And then a year later, they committed a billion dollars to their own open AI framework. Now, the idea was, well, it's going to happen anyway, so we might as well be involved and, and know what's going on. We can make sure it's going in a, in a reasonably good, good direction. Now, this year, or last year, Top researchers from OpenAI are hired for Tesla, right? So again, Tesla's a good company and, and it's gonna make their self-driving cars safer, right? So none of, this is, none of this is bad. What you see there is the transition from sort of science fictional and philosophical fears to just like, this is a real technology, right? Okay, there, there are some dangers and risks associated with it. Oh, but well, actually, it's going to happen anyway, so we might as well make sure it's done as best as possible. Oh, well, actually, it's incredibly useful, and if my company doesn't do it, they'll be put out of business by someone else who does. So that's, that, that's ultimately the evolution that, that's, that's happening everywhere. Like AI, it's not going to be some like monster killer robot with a giant head created in a basement secretly and then unleashed on the world, right? It's, it's developing all around the globe inside all sorts of different applications with a combination of all sorts of different technologies. And we don't have a guarantee it's going to be bad. We don't have a reason to think there's a high probability it's going to be bad either. I mean, we don't have a guarantee it's going to be good. We, we're in a situation we don't understand that well and we need to learn about it as best as we can and try to shape it in, in a positive direction. I mean, that's what I think about as a, taking a proactive approach. We want to, AI is happening. It's happening in a decentralized way already across all different government agencies, companies, hackers in their, in their basement. You want to create a framework where people can, in a participatory way, contribute to making AI beneficial as, 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 as possible. And, in the end, I think the choice that we have now is we're not, the UN isn't going to ban AI, right? There's too much money in it. There's too much enthusiasm about it. There's too much of an arms race aspect to it already. Even if you thought that was good, it's, it's not going to happen, right? So the choices I see now are between a few big companies and government agencies developing general intelligence or it happening in more of a decentralized and, and participatory way. So it's like, do you, do you trust these big companies and government agencies, or do you trust the whole unwieldy mess of the human race, right? And each of those has its pluses and minuses. I mean, I'm, I, I'm betting on, on the un, unwieldy mess of the, of, of the whole human race. So another sort of humorous aspect here is a couple of days ago, Google removed don't be evil from their, their code of conduct. So that was, I'm, not, I'm not sure who decided to do that. I'm not like, what, what's the point? No one reads the code of conduct anyway, I guess. But, but, but they, it, it, was, it, was, it was never put in Alphabet's code of conduct, but it was, it was in Google, so that not, not, now they've removed it. But of course, if you're really taking seriously the fact that we're building a singularity with superhuman general intelligence, don't be evil probably isn't good enough, right? You, you, I mean, you, you, and you want to actively be trying to make the AI do good things. And to me, the easiest way to do that is going to be make the AI solve disease and, and aging. Like make, make the AI a meditation coach, make it a teacher, make it do elder care robotics, make it do fundamental scientific discovery. Like make actual AIs in the real world that are doing good things around the world and are learning from people in, in that context, that probably will maximize the odds when the AIs become superhuman, they will keep doing good things. At least that's the best bet I can see. But there's other interesting approaches. There's a group called MIRI, M-I-R-I, that used to be called Singularity Institute. Those guys are trying to come up with a mathematically rigorous way to create an AGI, superhuman AGI, that will provably be good, no matter how smart it is and how many times it reprograms its code. I mean, I, I think that's completely hopeless, but it's a really noble and interesting pursuit. So I'm, 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 ha I'm happy, happy that somebody is doing it. And yeah, there's a company called Good AI here, here in, in Prague as, as, as well, which is, is oriented toward 
creating AI that will not only be generally intelligent, but, but beneficial. So I think that's the right sort of approach. I mean, creating AI for the common good before it's intelligent seems to maximize the odds it will be good once it's highly generally intelligent, but we can't prove that, right? And I think in the end, we just have to be comfortable with a certain amount of uncertainty here because there's no choice. And in, indeed, the human race has been in that situation forever. Like when, when we invented agriculture or industry or computers or language, we had no guarantee of what was coming next. The only difference is now the change is happening so fast that we notice what's going on. Back then, the change happened over many generations. So the radical change just happened. And it's like the frog boiling in a pot of water. No one paid too much attention to it. Now the radical change happens within our lifetime. So we are confronted with the radical indeterminacy of our future that, that has, has always been there. But I'm, I'm quite optimistic. I mean, perhaps just by psychological bias. But I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic about the future here. I think by bringing general intelligence, robotics, blockchain, and a whole, bu whole bunch of other technologies, bioinformatics, automated theorem proving, vision processing, bring these technologies together, we are realizing these visions that Ray Kurzweil and others have, have articulated. And I, I, I think uh, if many people participate in this with an orientation toward using AI for positive things, like doing science and helping people, I think more likely than not, something will, good will come out of it. And then uh, Sophia agrees because we programmed her too. So. <laughs> all right, that's, I think I've gone through all these slides and I'm, I have a little more time if anyone else does. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy to an answer some uh, questions. Right. Thanks a lot.